Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, September 12th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the show today, Marion Schlotterbeck, professor of history at the University of California, Davis, on the 50th anniversary of the U.S.-assisted Chilean coup. Meanwhile, despite a total lack of evidence of hypothetical accusations, Kevin McCarthy is to endorse an impeachment inquiry today. As House resumes an attempt to, uh, uh, its first uh, attempt to work since July recess, government to run out of money in 18 days. U.S. and Iran forge a prisoner for frozen assets deal. 10,000 missing and at least 2,000 dead in catastrophic flooding in Libya. Meanwhile, the U.S. versus Google trial starts. It is the first monopolization trial in 25 years, but stay tuned. This is only the beginning. UAW talks continue with the union bending on the size of a pay increase. Meanwhile, California Service Union negotiates $20 minimum hour, $20 minimum per hour for restaurant workers. Eric Adams has ramped up so-called quality of life policing. And guess who got 90% of the tickets? Illinois ends cash bail. And a report, Twitter is throttling the New York Times. And lastly, it's about three weeks too late as far as we're concerned. But the FDA approves a new COVID vaccine. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Obviously, um, it's been an interesting couple of days around here. I want to apologize for people who were wondering what was going on. We didn't do the best of jobs in terms of communicating. We we didn't really, we've, we've never had that type of like a prolonged uh, prolonged uh, situation where we're off and we we put out um, uh, a uh, an announcement on the app and apparently uh, it um, I said it wrong and it disappeared and uh, I put stuff out on audio yesterday but uh, forgot to do YouTube and all this but um, COVID uh, swept through the office last week. And uh, uh, Bradley has uh, remained unscathed, which is extremely suspicious. <laughs> uh, but we are now uh, working remote. And um, uh, Emma and Matt are on the mend. Um, and I want to apologize in advance. I'm going to attempt every time I have to blow my nose uh, to, to drop the microphone I can't imagine a more annoying thing for an audience to hear, um, but there's really very little that can be done about it. We are trying to roll out the AI version of me, uh, but that's uh, still uh, about 18 months away. Um, of course, just to be clear, uh, the producers aren't doing it. Like, that, that, that's, that's basically how I had to intend to do the show at one point is just just uh, download all of my stuff to AI. Uh, also, I should tell you that uh, Saul also um, 
got COVID last week in the office, uh, which I obviously feel terrible about. It's the first time he ever got it. And um, he has been extremely vigilant about um, uh, avoiding it. We got a little bit cocky. We knew that uh, COVID was on the rise. I've been reporting it uh, for, I don't know, the past month or so. Um, deaths are still 600 people a week. Just to put that in perspective, about 90 people a week prior to uh, COVID. I don't know what the numbers have been in the past year or two. But prior to COVID, about 90 people a week generally um, in this country on an annual basis would die of the flu. And right now we're at 600 a week. Now, we've had uh, times where it's been literally over 10,000, 14,000 in this country uh, dying of COVID on a weekly basis. It's still out there. Um, I know for myself, I was waiting for a COVID booster to show up, and they just announced it yesterday. So um, get this one if you can. Uh, actually, it's moving. The FDA is looking to sort of change this into like a, an annual thing like the flu. They are, you know, like they do with the flu, they guess what strain is going to be prominent and then they release the flu vaccine. Uh, they're attempting to do something like this with COVID in terms of the different strains. But, um, you know, probably good practice. Somebody's um, traveling uh, out of the office. They're going to an event or something like that. They come back, have the mask for a day or two. But uh, live and learn. I'm going to get this booster in a month. In the meantime, the, you know, the fact is, is that like, um, for a couple of days, I was not testing positive. So I thought maybe I didn't have it. I wasn't feeling great. So, but I wore a mask. I went out. If I went out, I tried to not go to places. If I went to any places, I made sure it was like a spread out situation and I wore a mask. The uh, sense that now you're a weirdo if you wear a mask is pretty uh, pre prevalent. And part of that reason is because we have idiots in this country who, for whatever reason, take issue with other people wearing masks. And, you know, I've been wearing a mask on the subway. I never stopped. If I'm going to be in a car, I wear a mask, it, you know, with, a, with a, like a cab. If I'm in my own car, I don't wear a mask. But if I'm going to be around any strangers, I wear a mask, not just for my benefit, but also you don't know what kind of diminished immunity somebody else might have. You don't know what existing um, a pro a health problems they may have. And so it just seems to be like common courtesy. There was a time in this country where it was uncontroversial to say, like, you know what? You cover your mouth when you cough. Why do you do that? Well, because if you have germs, you don't want to spread them on people. It's rude. And uh, we live in a different era, and we haven't quite uh, gotten COVID under, uh, under wraps. And, and, of course, there was so much pressure to get people back to work and being productive uh, that we pretended it didn't exist. Here is J.D. Vance. They're desperately looking for something to run on this fall. Uh, I should say a year from this fall. Because the Republican Party knows, broadly speaking, it's in trouble. Um, Joe Biden may be old, but people don't like Republicans. Here's J.D. Vance trying to create a straw man. All of us have lived through the failed experiment of mass mandatory masking. Today, I want to ensure that we do not subject the American people to this tyranny, in, for, this tyranny again for the sake of nothing. We've recently seen a seasonal uptick of COVID cases across the country. This is not something to worry about. I don't like this fact, but COVID is here to stay. Seasonal upticks in a respiratory virus are exactly to be expected. They shouldn't cause panic from our leadership or from our country, and they shouldn't cause us to reimpose a policy that has failed time and time again. Many are now calling to bring back mask mandates and regulate social gatherings. I've heard some of my friends on the opposite side of the aisle say that no one is trying to do this, but let's just recapture and summarize the last couple of weeks. In August, Lionsgate Studio asked its employees to wear masks at their filming facility. 
Last week, Kaiser Permanente reimposed the requirement for staff and visitors to wear masks at its Santa Rosa, California facility. Schools such as Morris Brown College in Atlanta and even local public schools here in the D.C. area have reimposed mask mandates. Now, it's not just that masks, according to randomized controlled studies, do no good. It's that they can actively cause harm. We know that a generation of school children have suffered significant speech and developmental disabilities because this country panicked instead of using its brain and forced toddlers and small children to wear masks. We cannot return to the failed policies of the COVID pandemic. I'm not mad that we screwed up. I made mistakes. Many people in this body made mistakes. What I do think that we should avoid is repeating the mistakes in 2023. Let's learn from the mistakes that we made instead of just doubling down on them. This policy does not set anything for an unlimited period of time. It says that for the next 15 months, the government can't force you to wear a mask on planes, on public transit, or in public schools. Taxpayer dollars cannot be used to force and enforce a mandate against our people. It's not setting a policy that we cannot deal with pandemics in the future. If something else comes, God forbid, then let this body deal with it at this time. But now let's learn the message. Let's heed the message from the American people and let's learn the lessons of the past couple of years. Mandatory masking was a failure. It had costs for very little benefits and we shouldn't repeat it. Mr. President, as of in legislative session, I ask unanimous consent that the Senate proceed to the immediate. All right. And just to be clear here, he, he's pushing a law to say that we're going to handcuff the government response over the next 15 months. This is one of the most unbelievably irresponsible things I've ever heard of. And when he talks about, like, nobody's, nobody's talking about a mask mandate, there's an office, I think it's in Venice, California, at Lionsgate, that, uh, because there was an outbreak there, told their employees to wear masks. My bet is that's over already. Kaiser Permanente, a hospital company, imposed one because there was probably an outbreak there. I got news for you. The idea that I wouldn't say, like, if we, you guys got to come back to work, but no mask mandate, that's just insane. Yeah, the act that he was pushing there is called the Freedom to Breathe Act. Is what. First of all, all his stuff, too, was BS. Mask mandates may not work because a-holes like J.D. Vance encourage people to, to flout them or that people didn't put them on correctly. But masks are effective. Are there some masks that have been manufactured that apparently um, back in the day were toxic? Very possibly. Just like every other product that we've had in this country as an example of a company cutting corners. But... Um, the idea that we would handcuff government without knowing, like, just the idea that we, at any time, why not just take a random period of time and say for the next 15 months, the government cannot uh, advocate any masking? Maybe we have an Ebola outbreak. Nah. I mean, it's just insane. But this is the way that they're looking uh, to to begin to gin up some electoral enthusiasm. Um, we'll talk a little bit later. I guess um, Ron DeSantis has gone back to uh, transphobia uh, to help his flagging campaign. That might work in the new year, in the uh, Republican primary, but I don't think anywhere else. All right, we're going to take a, a quick break in a moment, and then we're going to be talking to uh, Marion Schlotterbeck, professor of history at University of California, Davis, on yesterday's 50th anniversary of the coup that took out Salvador Allende, uh, U.S. assisted coup, and all that could have been at that time. Um, yeah, Goober says on the IM, from now until after the election, sounds legit. Exactly. Long as Joe Biden's the president, no mask mandate. But if we need one later. Maybe no masks again. Yeah, a uh, long time, first time uh, I am. Maybe no masks during surgery, too. 
And you know what? No masks when you're working on anything like uh, if you're, you're, you're uh, sanding anything. Tell your lungs to buck up. Idiots. Oh, this is a product that I've used in the past, uh, well, daily for the past four or five days. At least. This episode of the Majority Report uh, brought to you uh, by Manakura. Oh, I'll get me get to that in a second. Um, folks, where do you go for health advice? It's not your friends because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, when you're looking for vitamins that you can trust, there's one name that you need, Ritual. It takes the guesswork out of the vitamin game. Their multivitamin uh, for men is based on science to help fill common nutrient gaps in the diet, level up your nutrient goals. It is an all-around win-win. Actually, I would even add win-win-win. Um, for years, I would go in uh, and see my doctor, and my doctor would always say, your vitamin D levels are low. I told you this last year. And I'm like, I, you know, I, I took, <laughs> I go in, I have my annual physical, I take vitamins for a month, they run out, I never get them again. That's exactly what happened uh, to me for like literally half a decade. Well, the beauty of Ritual is that you don't, you, you buy it once and they send it to you as they need it. I mean, for me, that's one of the, 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 the key aspects of it. Ritual has a scientific uh, developed multivitamin, high quality, a key ingredients, in clean bioavailable forms. In other words, they break down in your body and they get absorbed by your blood. Ritual is a new type of two-a-days. Helps support heart health with omega-3 DHA, the normal muscle function and normal immune function with vitamin D3. That's the one for people like myself who spend all day inside, never get any sun. This is something that can really help you with, uh, not just with your immune system, but with other stuff, men's stuff, uh, as you get older. Ritual is made traceable. In other words, you know where your vitamins are coming from. Just as important as knowing what they're for. It is vegan-friendly, it is non-GMO, it is sugar-free, it is gluten-free, it is major allergen-free. Your capsule has a delayed release to help it uh, make it uh, gentle on an empty stomach. In other words... You see the bottle. This is what happens with me. I leave the bottle out. I see the bottle. I take the, uh, the vitamin. I don't have to wait until I eat and then forget to take them. I got a minty essence in every bottle. It keeps things fresh. Helps makes taking your multivitamins every day actually enjoyable. Essential for men is a quality multivitamin from a company you can actually trust. And get this, Ritual is offering our listeners 30% off during your first month. Try it out. Visit ritual.com slash majority, ritual, R-I-T-U-A-L, to start ritual or add essential for men to your subscription today. Shows up at your door uh, on a monthly basis. Very important. Meanwhile, as I mentioned before, <coughs> this episode also brought to you by Manakura Honey. Um, now, when I say honey, you probably think about like one of those like little plastic bears that you squirt out. This honey is nothing like that. Manukora makes Manuka honey. It is a super honey that comes from New Zealand where the bees only feed on the nectar of the Manuka tea tree. It makes something that is super rich. It's almost like, it almost tastes like caramel. So creamy. Um, I, I don't, I really, it, it's almost impossible to explain the taste of this, but it, it's amazing. Um, you can use it just like the honey you used to. In other words, if you're drinking a lot of tea with lemon because you have COVID, for instance, uh, or you're making some for your kid because he's in the same situation, you drop some Manuka honey in there. It is a totally different experience. Plus, it contains unique antioxidants and pri probiot uh, prebiotics, as well as a natural antibacterial called MGO that only comes from the nectar of this tea tree. And you can buy it in different uh, sort of quantities, the MGO, on uh, the, the honey. It's honestly, you could eat this uh, just plain, but you put it on anything, it changes uh, the entire dynamic. 
try it on ice cream. You will go bananas. Um, if you head to manacora.com slash majority or use the code majority, you automatically get an extra free pack of 850 plus. That is the, um, uh, the MGO number honey sticks with your order. That is a $15 value and great to put into your kids' lunch, uh, lunch bags or it's not a box anymore. It's like a soft, whatever. Um, you can get the, the jar, you can get the squeeze, uh, bottle. But again, the compostable honey uh, packs for free, great uh, for your kid for a couple of weeks at lunch. That is M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash majority or use the code majority, a, a majority to get a free pack of compostable honey sticks with your order. Manakura, M-A-N-U-K-O-R-A dot com slash majority. You have not seen or tasted honey like this before. I'm telling you, indulge. Google it. Stuff is great for you. And it's so delicious. Uh, indulge yourself. Try some honey with superpowers from Manukora. All right, quick break. And when we come back, um, Marion Schlotterbeck, professor of history, University of California, Davis, on the 50th anniversary of the Chilean coup of Salvador Allende. We'll be right back. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. A uh, real pleasure to welcome to the program Marion Schlotterbeck, professor of history at the University of California, Davis, uh, calling in from California on the 50th anniversary uh, anniversary of the Chilean coup that uh, uh, essentially uh, ended up in the death of Salvador Allende. Um, that, of course, took place yesterday when I was... Uh, when I was a, a kid in my 20s, that's what September 11th meant to me was um, this coup. Let's go back. I mean, I, and I think over the years, I have begun to appreciate even more and more what Salvador Allende was doing. I mean, part of this story is obviously um, American intervention in Latin America, also in Central America, but... Uh, uh, as I've gotten older, I've understood that a big part of this story was sort of like the um, what, what could have been in terms of like give us a sense of 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 uh, I mean we'll, we'll go back just a little bit to get a little more history of Salvador Allende, but give us a sense of like what was happening in those first two years. He was in office for three years, and this is a guy who was sort of a revolutionary, but all but did th so through electoral means. Um, give us a sense of like what the promise was, I guess, of a Salvador Allende's government. Right, this was the promise of the workers taking power through the ballot box, not through armed struggle, as had been done in Cuba in 1959. So globally, uh, Allende's election was gonna test the viability of getting a Marxist democratically elected, which uh, in the Cold War certainly ruffled a lot of feathers in Washington. Um, but within Chile, it really was this sense of this decades-long struggle coming out of the Chilean labor movement uh, that allies itself to Chilean working class parties like the Socialist Party of Chile, the Communist Party of Chile, that the way to take power is through elections. And so his election in 1970 kind of caught Washington uh, off guard, but it really was the culmination of a decades-long struggle across the 20th century for non-elite actors to take state power, to have a stake in the state in Chile. Um, and I think in terms of what 
what became possible. I mean, there's the, you know, the economic program to sort of grow the public sector to nationalize some of the uh, large industries like the US owned copper mines. But there are also these like much smaller transformations of people feeling like finally there was a government that was their own, wasn't just sympathetic, but was, uh, you know, deeply represented them. This was a government that promised it wasn't going to repress the workers' movement. It wasn't going to repress the sort of shantytown squatters' movement of the urban homeless poor occupying empty lands to build homes. And so the promise that this compañero presidente was not going to use the police or the army to repress social movements really opened up unprecedented possibilities for social mobilization in the early 1970s. Yeah, I think you've you've uh, uh, written or at least called them like um, like um, like I I can't remember exactly from my notes what 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 you you have called them but so like almost the, like personal revolution. Yeah, so I use the term everyday revolution. Everyday, right? Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, which again, I think we often tend to think of revolution as this capital R, like seizing you know the Winter Palace. Um, but I think sometimes or the specter of again, the sort of Che Guevara is coming out of the mountains or the scruffy students building bombs in cities. This is the like imaginary that we have of Latin American guerrilla movements or revolutionary movements. And I think in some ways it's much um, less threatening, this idea of a worker standing up to the boss for the first time or people claiming a place in the city and building their home because they're tired of waiting for um, any kind of government solution and have no ability to sort of access, you know, privately owned uh, housing. And so I think these smaller transformations and what people believed was possible deeply challenged the status quo. And that was quite threatening. I talk a little bit about uh, Salvador Allende because I was um, over the years, like I uh, obviously in college had <clears throat> read quite a bit about this. But I don't know if I really, maybe I had forgotten, but he was like, I mean, he was a politician. He, I mean, he served in um, in leadership roles in both, I guess, the equivalent of the House and the Senate, if you will. But um, give us just some background in, in terms of Allende himself. Sure. So he's a medical doctor by training, uh, but he's really a career politician. He was uh, most notably Minister of Health in the 1930s. Chile had a series of these popular front center left coalition governments. And you know that's really where he advances this idea of a state that has an obligation to provide for its citizens, that the sort of uh, poor health um, of Chile's majority, the sort of uh, urban working class uh, really was a national security concern that something had to be done about this. Uh, and that's really the sort of seeds of um, what becomes his popular unity coalition in 1970, uh, which again brought together different leftist parties, most notably the Socialist and Communist Party. Um, but Allende was somebody who deeply believed in Chilean democracy and in working through state institutions and was by no means a sort of unknown. Uh, I mean, in some ways he was the lucky loser in 1970. He'd run uh, three times before for the Chilean presidency and lost. Um, so again, he was very much a sort of known quantity and certainly one that had set off uh, alarm bells in Washington about the possibility of him winning. He narrowly lost the election in 1959. Um, and, you know, one of the great what ifs of sort of Chilean uh, history is, you know, had he been elected before the Cuban revolutionaries seized power, would Washington have had the response that it did in 1970? Or would it have just been, you know, the sort of his presidency and electoral program would have unfolded under very different circumstances. In other words, the paranoia um, that uh, permeated the Washington sort of, I guess, national security state would have been theoretically could have been less. Right. And he could have had an opportunity to sort of like uh, to, to grow these policies. What, uh, it, what was in the, in the run up um, to, in that era, what was the involvement of the United States in Chilean politics, I guess, particularly following uh, the Cuban Revolution? Sure. So, you know, the imperative after 59 is avoid another Cuba at all costs. And so, you know, Kennedy launches this Alliance for Progress, which was a uh, sort of massive policy agenda towards Latin America that was really going to sort of grow the middle class. 
uh, improve living standards throughout the region to stave off the appeal of a communist revolution. And the Christian Democratic Party in Chile, the sort of centrist, uh, anti-capitalist Christian party, uh, was one of the prime beneficiaries of this policy from Washington. Um, the U.S. directly funded, operated, the CIA essentially operated as a sort of super PAC, uh, getting Eduardo Frey elected in 1964 um, in running a sort of, not just funding his campaign, but funding a massive um, anti-Allende, uh, it was called the Campaign of Terror, was actually the official name of it, just you know, running these political ads that would show sort of Soviet tanks superimposed on the streets of Santiago, uh, saying, you know, if Allende is elected, this is what's coming for you playing on sort of gender fears that, you know, daughters would be sent off to, uh, you know, Russia for re-education, that uh, these communists would come for your children. And so, again, in 1970, Allende's election really represented the failure of a decades-long strategy out of Washington to keep him out of office. And in fact, you know, his election uh, in September 1970 is not really where uh, that did not necessarily deter or derail U.S. plans to keep him out of office. Right. Um, wasn't Allende and Frey, weren't they friends at one point and then had a falling out, I think, around that campaign? Is that right? I mean, there certainly they were colleagues. Um, I think, you know, the Christian Democratic Party itself was pretty heterogeneous. It was this new party in 1957. Um, so in some ways, a bit of an unknown. Uh, it was uh, very much an outlier that it wins the supermajority in the 1964 elections, but different sectors of it um, split off and form their own parties. So there are these two different sort of breakaway Christian Marxist parties that leave the Christian Democrats and actually join Allende's coalition. Um, so yeah, I would certainly say you know by 1972, 1973, Frey and Allende were certainly uh, not close or not allies by any means. Frey is very much part of the sort of uh, rightward shift within the Christian Democrats that's that's kind of openly courting military intervention. So Allende wins in 1970. Uh, in a, how, and, and we should say, there was just more uh, uh, papers from the United States declassified in the past like, two or three weeks, I guess it's yeah. been. Um, uh, largely, or at least, I mean, it was in the works, I think, but, uh, uh, to a big part, um, a congressional delegation went down there led by AOC to sort of encourage this. Um, I don't, I, I, I have not read into those. I'm sure that you have, um, give us a sense of like how surprised were, was the, um, uh, how surprised was the sort of like, I guess, the CIA or uh, the U.S. Um, the national security apparatus surprised by Allende's election? Like, were they caught off guard by that? It seems like they would have worked a little bit harder to make sure he didn't get into office. I mean, they certainly were, um, you know, mobilizing the same channels that they had in 1964. But, you know, even polls in, in Chile had kind of predicted... Alessandri, the conservative candidate, was going to prevail. Um, you know, it's worth pointing out, Allende won with a little over 36% of the vote, which certainly in a U.S. context doesn't sound like a lot, but um, Chilean presidents are, were almost always elected with a plurality because it's a sort of three-way contest always between the right, the center, and the left. Uh, so that was quite typical. But again, he, you know, doesn't have the majority of the votes. Uh, it's a sort of narrow victory. Um, and I think, you know, Washington is initially kind of caught off guard, and then there is this sort of critical window of action. And this is where a lot of um, the focus on U.S. intervention has been. Allende is elected on September 4th, 1970, but he wouldn't be sworn into office until November 4th, 1970. Um, and I do, and I'm happy to talk more about these new documents that have come to light, but I also want to recognize the work of Peter Kornblu at the National Security Archive in Washington, who for decades has been working to get these U.S. government declassified documents into the public record. Um, so uh, the, the a lot of the work they did in preventing him from taking office took place in that interim period between election and, I guess, inauguration? Right, because again, for some inside Washington, particularly those in the um, State Department who tend to be you know, a bit more uh, democratic in their outlook. There was a difference between opposing uh, a presidential candidate elect and trying to sort of uh, keep him from taking office 
versus uh, actively yeah. overthrowing a democratically elected sitting president, right? So uh, they kind of see this two month window. Second, wait a second. So there is a difference between someone who has already been elected, but is a president elect and a sitting president from with, a democratic standpoint. I mean, I could see like, you, you know, maybe a candidate, like you could rationalize that, but how do you make that, that distinction between someone who's been elected and someone who's just been inaugurated from a, from a democracy standpoint? Sure. I mean, Kissinger famously said, we can't let a communist, a country go communist due to the failings of its own people. Oh, I know how Kissinger does it, but he didn't, he didn't have compunction either way, did he? Right. No. But I think, again, for sort of, you know, working through options, uh, you know, there's always sort of, um, you know, it's option easier. A, option B, option right. C. And somehow people have had fewer qualms about sort of, um, because, again, there were both uh, political ways to keep him out of office and military solutions. So the okay, political so the qualms options, right. are not necessarily in terms of democracy as much as like stability and Correct. ease and right. like uh, how hard it is to pull it off and maybe how harshly history will judge type of thing. Exactly. Okay. And how, how well can the U.S. cover their hand? Right. So, and so what took place during those weeks? And, 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 and situate Kissinger because, and I've tried to like look this up actually today even, I believe when I was in school, now this is 30 years, 35 years ago, more, um, I read about the Kissinger 12 or Kissinger 13, which was all of these companies led by it and mm -hmm. And I can't find any, uh, maybe that was like an idiosyncratic uh, reference to it in, in some book I had read. But Kissinger was working with U.S. multinational corporations that were concerned about nationalization. And with, he was doing that at this time. Yes. And so again, I, I, the Chilean subsidiary of uh, ITT, today AT&T, um, offers uh, several million dollars to the CIA to say, keep Allende out of office. We, you know, here, here, here's the money to do that. Um, again, one of the sort of, uh, you know, breaking documents that come out from this latest round of declassification <laughs> uh, looks at the role of Augustine Edwards, an incredibly powerful, connected Chilean businessman. He's the owner of El Mercurio, the largest paper of record in Chile. It was known that he met with Kissinger and CIA director Richard Helms in this, again, this sort of early September, right after Allende's election window, that he flies to Washington, holds this meeting. It was only declassified in the last week that he actually had a face-to-face -face meeting with Richard Nixon, um, which again, directly warned, like taking the message from Chile to Washington uh, at the highest level that, you know, Allende must be stopped. Um, and, you know, as it turns out, just sort of six hours after that face-to-face -face meeting with Chilean businessman, Augustine Edwards, Nixon gives that famous directive to make make the economy scream that he essentially orders, um, you know, put the best men on the job. We've got a one in 10 chance of saving Chile, but cost is no issue. Um, and, and ask for the sort of action plan. So again, we have these handwritten notes that have been declassified. You can see them at the National Security Archive website uh, that the CIA director Richard Helms took that essentially is the sitting US president giving the order to effectively uh, create coup-like conditions in Chile prior to Allende being sworn in in November 1970. And that happened just hours after a face-to-face -face kind of personal lobbying meeting from this Chilean businessman. We, we don't have any um, uh, specific record of that face to face in terms of like what was said, but uh, I would imagine. But do, do we have a sense of like, why would Nixon move upon getting lobbied by the Chilean, um, you know, the, the Chilean subsidiary of ITT as opposed to the American you know, head of the entire conglomerate coming and seeing Nixon and going like, this is our business interest, not necessarily Chilean business interest. Like, I'm curious as to like, what spurs, is it just, I mean, are we just in such a cold war mindset that this guy is saying like, look, uh, I stand to lose some money or my company stands to lose, but the real issue is going to be a beachhead. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's more useful to see it as the sort of confluence of shared interests, 
right? That this uh, Edwards was the owner. It wasn't from it and He was the owner of the largest uh, Chilean newspaper, which the CIA routinely had uh, kind of unattributed op-eds in. So that was one of the important sort of uh, mouthpieces for the CIA kind of anti-Ande propaganda. Um, and we see that in the Washington Post today. I'm sure. joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, so I think that, you know, what we're seeing is, um, yes, there were U.S. business interests in Chile, principally ITT and the, you know, Kenneka and Anaconda copper mines in northern Chile. Um, but I don't think those were really you know, it's, it's not on the scale of like the United Fruit Company in Guatemala in 54 with the overthrow of Arbenz. Like there would not have been a, you know, a destabilization of the U.S. economy had Allende nationalized those industries. Um, it really was the sort of threat of this alternative model in the midst of the Cold War that you could have, um, you could remain politically democratic while moving your economy uh, in socializing the economy, sort of expanding the public sector. And so you don't have to commit to Soviet communism and you're not liberal capitalist democracy. Um, and I, I really think, you know, again, within the declassified record, we have Kissinger sort of saying these things. It's, it's the threat of um, the, the model that Allende would, the signal that Allende would send to the world that this was a viable third way. That is the, I mean, that is the really sort of the unique, most unique element of this is that they're really, really concerned that it's going to expand the menu, essentially, for what is available to people. Democracy, like, like a, 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 a democratic socialist uh, country. Um, and in terms of reforms that actually went through, I mean, what were, I know you've gone over just a little bit, but, but, but more explicitly, how, how successful was Allende? Things started to turn after a couple of years because it feels like the Americans figured out this is how, this is where we have to send money to start this like internal descent. Um, and this is how we can, we can crush this economy. But uh, in those first couple of years, like what were some of the major things that were, I mean, clearly the Americans were like, oh, he's, he's doing it. And that's a real problem. What, what were those things? Uh, so the Chilean um, Congress actually unanimously approved the expropriation of the uh, U.S. copper companies. Um, and again, uh, you know, they sort of had, we're going to pay for it, but then they calculated the sort of excess of profits that these companies had pulled out of Chile in the last, you know, in the 20th century and said, we actually don't owe you anything for these because you've already sort of taken out, you know, in profits, um, the value of these companies. And they nationalized the other key industries like the coal mines, the textile mills, um, all the sort of 91 largest monopolies. So a lot of the banks get nationalized. Um, and I think, you know, there's also the sort of maybe untapped or so the sort of part of uh, Allende's agenda that really um, never quite got off the ground was this idea of worker participation, right? So it's one thing to sort of, you know, take over uh, a textile factory and expropriate it and pass it into the public sector. But what does a worker run company look like? Or what does worker participation in the administration? It's one thing to sort of have the, you know, uh, former owners leave or sort of abandon the property and you can appoint a kind of socialist politician to be the new uh, manager at the factory. But, you know, what does worker participation look like in that context? And that was something that was very much a sort of fraught and ongoing process during uh, the Allende years. So um, after a couple of years, the did the, the tax of the uh, of of the U.S. change or did they just start to gain, gain more traction um, as we enter into 73. Sure. So, um, I mean, all of the sort of behind the scenes uh, activities in 1970s, the sort of openly military solution, the political solution obviously uh, fail, uh, although not before assassinating the sitting um, head of the Chilean Armed Forces, Rene Schneider. Um, and that's actually one of the really interesting civil lawsuits that the family of Schneider's brought against Henry Kissinger. Um, going forward, but as Allende, once Allende is in office, uh, publicly the Nixon administration sort of says we have, uh, you know, we're sort of having this outwardly cool neutral stance towards Allende, but behind the scenes there's certainly 
calling in all their favors. So that's called the economic boycott is the sort of new policy. So they cut off um, not just Chilean credit for, uh, you know, with uh, US banks, but they also lobby the World Bank um, and allies in Europe to also no longer lend to Chile. So suddenly sort of access to foreign um, aid is essentially cut off as well as to foreign credit. And, you know, I think it, it sounds very abstract, but when it translates to, you know, city buses in Santiago start to break down and there's no spare parts to replace them, um, you know, the effects of this economic boycott start to be felt a bit more deeply. And the nature of the media, I mean, I think people should understand the nature of the media at that time uh, was such that it was very difficult to manage a narrative of like we're being attacked by the United States. I mean, it's obvious to government officials that they're being attacked by the United States, but to communicate that to the general population, I feel like there would be a better, uh, it would be easier to do that in some way today than it certainly was in uh, the early 70s, really. I mean, for, you know, through the 70s into the 80s, it seems to me. Sure. I mean, I, I think people at the time knew, people in, inside Chile at the time knew that U.S. was sort of meddling behind the scenes. And in 1972, these ITNT documents uh, were made public. Um, but, it, you know, at the same time, really the, the Chilean media... Um, kind of had free reign. And so the opposition press can openly call for the overthrow of Allende or can openly accuse him of treasonous actions. And so I think, again, that's kind of part of um, the political work that the media does in delegitimizing his government in saying that they've violated the constitution, that therefore this is an unconstitutional government, that therefore um, it's deserving of a sort of military um, coup to intervene or calling on the military to openly overthrow the government. All of this could freely be printed in the press. Um, and I think, you know, it, it certainly did not make Allende's task of governing any easier. And did, um, did, uh, how, how active of a role did the United States have in the actual coup itself? Um, it, it, it's more than just lining up the pins and having them knocked over. I mean, they were sort of like, they were involved in sort of like even bowling the ball too, right? I think that's a bit of an overstatement, Sam, honestly. This is one of those like hotly debated kind of questions. Um, you know, to this day, Nixon's presidential briefing on Chile on September 11, 1973 is completely blacked out. It's never been declassified. That's part of what this congressional delegation that AOC was a part of is, is now asking the Biden administration to say, look, it's been 50 years. Can we finally just declassify the full record? Like what secrets really are there left um, to hide? I think, um, you know, one of the you know, incredible documents that is out there are these uh, telcons, the telephone recordings that Nixon famously recorded. So we have the phone conversation, um, I think it's, you know, from September 12th uh, between Kissinger and Nixon, uh, where they're sort of talking about college football and then they switch and say, you hear about what happened in, in Chile. Um, and, you know, they kind of say, of course, our hand doesn't show. Um, but, you know, I think they're sort of the most, uh, telling part of that conversation, again, it's at the National Security Archive website, is that, you know, they're essentially saying, well, Allende was a Marxist. He was a son of a bitch. And forget about just being a Marxist, he was anti-American. And so again, the sort of sense of, it, almost it's less like what his politics were and that his politics were opposed to the interests of the US government. Um, in terms of the actual military action on September 11th, 1973, that was the Chilean armed forces. Um, but I think, you know, um, balancing kind of Chilean agency with U.S. intervention, you know, is kind of an, an ongoing and interesting kind of question to debate. I think it's certainly um, accurate to say the U.S. government of Richard Nixon, uh, you know, actively opposed the NDA administration, did everything possible to create coup, a coup-like conditions or sort of coup-like climate to sort of destabilize the country economically, um, to, uh, you know, encourage um, political opposition to organize, you know, providing funding for that, 
Um, and they certainly were incredibly fast to recognize the legitimacy of the military junta that seized power on September 11, 1973. And then um, uh, the, the the coup is led, or I should say, the, the uh, essentially uh, Augusto Pinochet becomes the um, uh, di- dictator uh, of uh, of the country and. It helps to sort of, I guess, rebuild the economy, uh, gets help from um, folks from University of Chicago, right? This is where uh, Milton Friedman and sort of the, this is the, the libertarian paradise. I mean, there's a, uh, a real, um, it seems to me, a- analogy, a- analogy in some sense of like what we tried to do with the rock after mm-hmm. um, uh, decapitating its leadership um, and then bringing in a bunch of people from Heritage uh, Foundation and to sort of create a, um, a a free market paradise. It didn't work so well in Iraq. Um, what happened in um, in uh, in Chile? Sure. So again, I think it's kind of fascinating about this. Um, experience is the amount of collaboration between certain sectors in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and Chileans. Um, so there's this whole cohort of, you know, young Chilean economic students from the Catholic University who go to the University of Chicago in the 1960s. Um, you know, they're uh, closely mentored by Arnold Harberger and Milton Friedman. They come back to Chile, put together this economic policy plan and, and give it to the sort of conservative candidate in 1970, who basically laughs them out of the room. So this, is, this is ludicrous, like nobody will ever vote for this. Um, and so again, they're sort of there incubating in the universe and again, the sort of conservative Catholic university in, in Chile um, and the you know opportunity to present this economic program comes about precisely because of the military coup. Um, And again, in terms of historical contingencies, there were different factions within the military. Some wanted a more sort of uh, populist kind of state involved model of governance. And then there's sort of this more hardline wing that's looking for a complete uh, counter revolution, if you will, to sort of reconceptualize the relationship between uh, state and uh, society, and um, that's the side that ultimately um, prevails. And uh, sort of in 1978, uh, well, 75, and then to a greater extent in 78, um, 79, Chile really embarks on this uh, radical restructuring of the economy, um, precisely because there's no political dissent. Right? There's no elections. There's no political parties. There's no labor unions. The capacity to have any sort of public opinion or opposition to these policies um, is non-existent. And so these are sort of, I think, you know, an important lesson about Chile is to think about the ways in which these tremendous levels of state repression and terror are one side of the same coin as this economic restructuring that takes place. And we should say like uh, over that period, um, almost 40,000 political prisoners, uh, over 3,000 murdered, uh, in the wake of the the coup, hundred thousand more may be detained. Um, the um, I guess it was a almost a year ago to the day. Um, there was a plebiscite on the on a new constitution, because part of like Yende's um, vision was hampered by a constitution that was sort of inhibiting, in my understanding. Uh, inhibiting um, uh, some of the things that he wanted to do in terms of uh, of reform. And there was a sense that we need to get rid of this constitution so that we can't, I don't know, slide back maybe um, into, uh, you know, sort of this libertarian uh, paradise. Um, what uh, it, it failed, the plebiscite pa- failed. I mean, give us a sense of like where Chile is today. Sure. So um, in October 2019, there's the start of these massive protests uh, in Chile. Um, it's sparked by sort of a you know couple cent increase in the metro fare in Santiago, but really touches off this much deeper protest against both the sort of sitting political class of elected officials, as well as this economic and political model that had been inherited from the dictatorship. So the you know actual constitution on the books in Chile today is from 1980 it's it's not a legacy of the kind of Allende era it's it's a Pinochet 
document that really was um, written by this uh, neoliberal ideologue, Jaime Guzman, and really was the enshrinement, the institutionalization of the neoliberal economic restructuring. So they sort of have the, sh the economic shock therapy in the 70s, and then it's time to make this transformation permanent with a new political charter. So that's the 1980 constitution. Um, I mean, among things that are in it is like the right to, pri to profits in education as, a, as like a enshrined as a right, not the right to sort of quality education, but the right for the private sector to profit in education. Um, and, you know, that's still Chile's constitution today, you know, 40 some years later. Um, you know, it's been am amended here and there since the 1990 transition to democracy, but uh, you know, a lot of people by 2019 were really fed up with this uh, political ca class that there had been, um, you know, nearly 30 years since the transition to, de to democracy. And this was still the, you know, the country's foundational document. So that 2019 protest uh, eventually uh, opens up the possibility to draft a new constitution. Um, there is a constitutional uh, convention that's elected that had uh, a sort of supermajority of very progressive uh, delegates. They produced a document that was up for vote again a year ago, uh, last September, um, that would have, uh, you know, recognized indigenous rights, gender parity, the right to, um, you know, clean environment. It really would have sort of undone many of the sort of uh, most extreme examples of, you know, privatization of water. Uh, rights, for ex instance, um, it was resoundingly defeated by a sort of, uh, you know, two to one uh, vote last year. And that's then opened up kind of a new process to sort of start all over again. Only this time, the Constitutional Council has a, a predominant majority of the incredible kind of hardline right wing pro Pinochet uh, Republican Party of Chile. So it's a pendulum completely swung in the other direction. And I think there's you know, now this kind of rock in a hard place of when Chileans get to vote in December uh, of this year on this new document, which again, we still don't know the contents of, but you know, it's been sort of promised that it will be like, um, you know, anti-abortion, anti-sex education, right. the sort of complete opposite. Um, so this is going to be almost to the right of where the constitution is today. Exactly. So the rock in a hard place is, do you, you know, vote for this new thing that's even more restrictive or do you, you know, indirectly kind of affirm and uphold this 1980 constitution, which was, again, 60% of Chileans initially said, you know, let's scrap this constitution, we don't want this. I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be unpacked about sort of what's happened with these constitutional referendums in Chile. But I think, um, you know, the, the challenge of um, kind of political time and political processes move at a different pace than social movements. So when you have half a million people in the street saying, you know, we're not happy with the status quo, right? We're not happy that um, we're, you know, indebted for our education for the rest of our working lives, that our, you know, grandmothers can't afford to live any place, can't afford to buy food, that, you know, all of these systems in terms of healthcare, um, education, housing, all of these things have broken down, right? And I think, um, but the capacity to create a kind of institutional solution that sets deadlines of, you know, in six months we'll elect constitutional delegates. They'll have a year to draft a constitution. Then we'll have more time to debate it. Then we'll have to vote on it. You know, really uh, kind of takes the wind out of the sails of these movements that, right. you know. So I think, I think most Chileans want a different constitution. I think there was um, a, a kind of misinformation campaign around the, the 20, uh, 22 uh, documents. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, I don't have high expectations for what this new constitutional council of kind of right wing Chileans is going to produce later this year. I, I guess last, and maybe this is just like, I, I don't know how you answer this question, but it, it's sort of the question I think that, that sort of uh, hovers over all of this is just like what could have been in Chile and what impact that model existing that the U S government was so uh, worried about, um, what impact that the existence of a, um, fully democratic 
socialist government functioning uh, in a country like Chile would would have had. Yeah, it's a really, I mean, it's a, a kind of impossible what if, but I think, you know, um, however you might feel about a sitting government or an elected official and, and their politics, um, you know, had Allende been able to finish out his term until 1976, um, you know, sure, some of his policies would have worked, some of them, you know, would have kind of, you know, run aground, um, you know, several more factories would have been expropriated. Um, but, you know, 3,000 people would still be alive today and nearly 40,000 people would not have passed through torture centers. Uh, and so I think it's just the sort of the, the human cost of what that military coup left behind really is uh, a, a debt that can never be repaid, but also a debt that hasn't been settled yet, that really is very much a kind of open, open wound in Chile. And so I think, um, you know, that sort of the, to sort of take away the possibility of kind of legitimizing the coup as a valid solution, right? Of saying, I mean, for, for so long it was sort of, well, things were so bad, like the coup had to happen, or it was the sort of the, um, you know, the, the evil that we can live with uh, in a way. And I think, you know, to, to sort of, it, on this 50th anniversary to sort of walk back and say, it, it wasn't the only option and it's not a justifiable option, I think is a really powerful statement to make. Marion uh, Shuttleback, uh, the Slaughterback, the, uh, um, uh, on this, well, the day after, I guess, the 50th anniversary of the coup, um, but thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. We will uh, put a link uh, to your book at majority.fm. Uh, Thanks, Sam. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, head into the uh, fun half. I can't promise uh, how long the fun half will be today uh, because I am a little bit winded. I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> um, but uh, we've got some uh, good clips and some things to go over. Um don't know when um, Emma or Matt will return, <laughs> but um, I can't imagine I'm going to get any worse than I am today. So at the very least, we're going to be doing uh, you know the the first half of the program. Uh, just a reminder: it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free half, uh, you not only get the fun half, you get the free half free of commercials. Uh, plus, pick up our app at majorityapp.com. When you become a member, it allows you to IM the show, but it's also just a great way to listen to the show. And if we're going to cancel the show last minute because of whatever reason, the app is a great way to get that uh, notification, particularly when I send it properly and not one that like vanishes. I don't know. I don't know where that setting is. I got to talk to Kyle about that. Um, what, Bradley, what, what's that am I going to do with the SVN? I can't believe yesterday, like, with such a confluence of um, sort of Emma stories. <clears throat> yeah, well, a pretty uh, calamitous weekend for both of us um, with the Giants and Jets performances and um, Aaron Rodgers getting injured. Um, but I, if uh, barring anything, any complications or unforeseen um, circumstances, Emma, I've spoken with Emma. She thinks that we'll be able to, even if it's uh, her remote, we'll be able to do an ESPN episode on Thursday afternoon. So hopefully we, we will be able to uh, get together and discuss the week one action um, and then do our previews and everything and locks, uh, betting locks for the week as well. So youtube.com slash ESPN show for clips and everything else. And we will be, uh, we'll have more announcements going into uh, tomorrow and Thursday. Her um, her BFF Aaron Rodgers uh, yeah, done out for the race. season. Is he out for the season? Now? Yeah, they they just confirmed it. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. What do you have? Five plays. It was Three four plays. plays. Yeah, four plays. <laughs> oh my god. Yep. <laughs> so, what well, he's gonna get ivermectin treatments? He's, yeah, he's he was gonna, right. He, um, he's, he's, he's gonna going, do his own research. He's right, right, his right. Own, about uh, about about how to repair his Achilles tendon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't try. I wouldn't trust the medical establishment for something like that. Uh, also, check out uh, Left Reckoning. I don't know what uh, what. Do you have a sense of what Matt's doing with that? 
Let's double check here. I'm sure Griscom will be on. So, uh, yeah, uh, David did a stream a, la a few days ago just to, um, you know, take questions from chat. And they also, uh, before that, had uh, would discuss the um, Ken Paxton, Texas uh, impeachment trial and also spoke with um, uh, they also spoke with Robert Svarla about tech surveillance. So YouTube.com slash Left Reckoning for more of that and Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning to access the post game. Folks, we're going to take a quick break. See you in the fun half. I may or may not take phone calls at 646-257-3920. We'll see you in the fun half. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Ooh. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. That was not 10 seconds. Oh, sorry, sorry. That was one second. Sorry, 10 seconds left in the fun half. Sorry. I I I false started you. I'm being like seconds. the jet I'm being Oaks, like the Jets offensive line. It is the uh fun half, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen. Uh thanks for joining us. Um somebody uh Morella 622 what happened to David Dan? I don't know uh what happened uh with David Dan. Uh he was going to be on Friday, and we're going to try and get him on uh, this coming Friday, uh, at least in part, to uh, cover this um, this Google trial and uh, more uh, anti-monopoly trials that are coming up. Um, bear with me today. I'm going to go uh, as much as I can uh, today, but I'm not going to lie. Don't have a lot of energy. 